It's 4 o'clock on a Friday. Yeah, TGIF, baby. And you are just in time for another exciting episode of Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour. Woohoo! Hang out, be cool, ask questions. Yeah, all of that. And thank you, fake band. Thank you, fake audience. Very high tech. How are you guys? Let me get that chat room open and say hello to everybody real quick. John Pearson, Darren Moss, Bob Gunnerfelt. That's it, huh? <laughs> you guys are the early risers. Darren Fletcher. There you are. People starting to show up. Actually, I've got to open that door a little bit to eliminate that reflection. And going to make it one degree cooler in here because it's about a hundred degrees outside and you guys keep asking about the fires um still doesn't really smell like fires are out there but you can tell that they are out there because we've got helicopters water dropping helicopters flying up and down the 101 a little bit today and we've got the very hazy smoke filled sky but oddly enough it doesn't smell like smoke out there so Yay, I hope uh, nobody's homes are burning. That's what we all hope for every time we have a round of fires out here. Hello, Nancy, Edmund, Cass, El Rosso. Excuse me. Trying a new drink today. We've been getting into LaCroix bubbly water, and today I'm having pastique, which is watermelon flavor. Let's try. Ew, what's that? Not bad. All right. Cool. Hello, Andre. Wind chimes. All right. Um, thank you guys for going in the comments section. Well, before I forget, because uh, I always forget, uh, give us a like. We'd appreciate that. Um, if you are watching today's show and you're not a subscriber, please do subscribe. Hit that red button. And you can hit that little bell-shaped thing up in, I think it's up in the upper right-hand corner. Um, that will give you notifications when we go live. Supposedly, when you subscribe, you're supposed to do that, but people have been reporting on the show that it's not working all that well. Um, but I saw that uh, John Pearson, Robert Orzachowski, Cass, and Tony Salazzo um, made some comments and left some questions in there. Um, Yep, the taxi in the background, you know, it's the end of the week, so I put the taxi driving away. That's the first time in 28 years that we've had a, a shot of the cab's rear end. Uh, Peter Rahel's got a quarantine happy hour prescription. Well, share with your friends. Uh, hello, spiritual Dan Weber, Martin Gravel, Al Harrison. Um, Yep, the tail end. Wow, more good stuff. Uh, I see Andre commenting about more good stuff in logic. Um, it's funny, you know, yesterday or the day before, I was talking about the new computer that I'm going to order in preparation for the road rally because this one's getting just a little sketchy and I can't even have a 1% uh, chance it'll crap out. But over the last two days, I've been talking to companies that specialize in doing um, webcasting. And uh, I told them, uh, we're not trying to look like CNN. Um, I sent them links to one of these episodes so they could see. And it looks like it's gonna be somewhere between like seven and $8,000. Excuse me. Um, to hire them for a day of post or pre-production and then three days of actual broadcasting. So uh, probably going to do it. They, I'm talking to two companies. They both sound very knowledgeable and it will take a lot of pressure off me to have somebody who's exceedingly experienced at doing this stuff if we have anything go south and hopefully with them doing it, uh, it won't go south. But... 
what that means is I don't need like the 3,000 plus, actually by the time I added extra memory and other stuff, it's like 37 or 3,800 bucks for a laptop. Can't imagine leaving that on an airplane. Wow. Um, Seven to $8,000 cheaper than the hotel. Well, the hotel technically doesn't cost us anything because we get by if they fill the hotel with sleeping room nights sold, then we get the ballroom and all that other stuff for free and the luncheons. We don't make any money on the luncheons that all goes to the hotel. So that stuff gets us the ballroom and the classrooms. Kind of a trade. Um, anyway, so yeah, it would be, uh, hello, John Hope. Um, it would be comforting to have that guy here acting as technical director and also as a you know a setup person and a problem solver and i would probably uh still fly brie out to do um you know kind of the producer stuff of reaching out to the talent you know half an hour before they go live and testing all their connections and all. We're talking amongst ourselves, you know, trying to work it all out, but I'm feeling very, very, very good about it. Hello, Robert Orzachowski. How are you? Um, all right. So I want to let's start right off the bat talking about uh, these things. Uh, Cass posted last night. Cass McKenty, is he here? Yeah, there he is. Good idea. Uh, I see him now. Um, Hello, Yuka and Michael Reschke. Uh, Cass said, maybe we could talk about the different ways members uh, back up their files. So, you know, I don't know that I've ever talked about that and I don't have a recommended way because I don't have files, but I'm really curious to see what you guys are doing. So, uh, oh, by the way, both of the video guys um, commented how good uh, my little Brio camera looks on, on these episodes so I was very uh, surprised to hear that I mean I know that it looks pretty good but one of the guys said well yeah we've got a really good looking camera we'll bring out and then he, he saw this and he went wow I can't believe that your Brio uh, looks that good so yay Brio which is made by Logitech um, so let's talk about backend files and then Tony Salazzo uh, commented on Cass's comment um, how he wants to know how people structure their folders as in genre and the taxi number other tips on when the song is done like do people make a few alt mixes in, in case a year or some years later they're needed but you've rebuilt or updated your system that's a great point um, it'd be tricky to recreate the old DIY uh, oh the old day library versions um, okay so let's start out with the basic question that Cass brought up uh, can you guys chat in the chat room um, how you store your files, how you back up your files? Pierre says he backs up one on a separate USB disk and on the cloud using Google Drive. Excuse me. Um, Darren Moss says he just started using a, a DAW, so I'd love to know about storage. Won't take long till there's no room on your Mac, that's for sure. Uh, JP backs up with flash drives and iCloud. Um, little redundancy. Yeah, redundancy is awesome. Um, Nancy Clell says my, my orange shirt is a power color on me. It looks good. Uh, I'm blocking everything, but from my chin down is all blocked, so I just moved the chat room out of the way. But uh, as I put it on, I went, wow, there's a combo that I've never done. And uh, orange, safety orange is my favorite color, but this is not quite safety orange. It's not that like fluorescent, you know, like the color of a cone you would see uh, blocking a street off or something. But it's Laker colors, even though I've only been to one Laker game in my life. But thank you for the compliment. Uh, Pete Mason, whoops, let me go back up uh, while I was busy yakking about my shirt. Um, okay, Michael McGraw uses external hard drives. 
Paul Etheridge uses one terabyte drive. It's amazing. I think I bought a two terabyte drive about a year ago, and I want to say it's 50 ish dollars. Unbelievable. I've got a one terabyte drive upstairs somewhere stashed away, and the thing is half the size of a shoebox. It weighs about six pounds, and it cost about $400. I didn't get it all that long ago. I probably got it like, I don't know, seven years ago, I guess, in, in electronics time. That was a long time ago. Uh, Robert Val, of course, uses Dropbox and Box. Um, Ooh, Andre says he backs up on an external hard drive. Don't use iCloud. It slows down your computer. Uh, Edmund says there's a technique which consists of three backups, uh, one on location, one off-site, and one on the drive. Yeah, you know, for Taxi, we used to use FileMaker Pro for all the member database stuff. We actually had the database offline, and then we had an online database for people who joined that day and then we would actually do an import every morning from the online database to the offline database and the reason was that many many years ago like I don't know 15 or more years ago um, we had to sue a competitor they were actually trying to hack into um, Taxi's database gee what nice people they were and so while we were building our online our own online submission system i made the decision to keep everything but that day's new information off off of the website you know and have it be our database the official taxi database of submissions and everything was actually offline so that they couldn't hack it um and now we've got a uh uh, an online system that's backed up in like three different places and there you go but it, it's scary out there I mean come on let's face it somebody who really wants your stuff is going to find a way to get it um, Pete Mason uses an external USB hard drive uh, cloud Lucian uses a cloud and external hard drive um, Michael Reschke backs up on two X hard drives in iCloud. Dan Weber's got two backup drives. Oops, that was a big jump. Uh, redundancy in a different location. Yeah, the different location part is important. Uh, yes, do the laptop. I use an external hard drive, a flash drive but I'm too cheap to pay for iCloud at this point. That's from uh, L. Harrison. Cass says he uses an external hard drive, uses external hard, hard drives, plural, labeled, kept in a file cabinet, only the last four years of work on the studio computer. There you go. John Hope uses a one terabyte and a four terabyte external drives, getting an eight terabyte external and internal extra drive. Wow. That is gonna be some serious backup. Um, Darren Fletcher, same as Pierre, one on external drive, one on the cloud. Uh, many home routers like Asus will let you set up your own cloud storage. You could keep a copy at a family or friend's house. Offsite is important. Yeah, you know, every time we get fires here in Southern California, it reminds all of us how important uh, it is to have stuff backed up. Nothing's more important than family photos. Jesse J. Peck, once recorded in my Zoom console, I back up to my PC. Uh, Martin Gravel uses an external solid state drive and cloud. Uh, if you don't have three different copies, you don't have any backup. Why is that? I would think two would be sufficient but you know i mean three is obviously better um but to be so like cut and dry about it that if you don't have three you don't have it i don't get that excuse me um crash gates gee i remember buying my first two gig hard drive for two thousand bucks wow dan weber wrote my own batch file to back back up my stuff incrementally so can only back up the new things that have changed. That's smart. Uh, 
test verify your backups oh yeah um, Ian Shortle uses an external drive in his PC storage yep we did have somebody trying to hack us I don't understand this Paul uh, Paul Etheridge says sneaker net always have offline storage Uh, Brad Gray says, on a separate note, if you ever get rid of a hard drive, destroy the drive if you want your data secure. Formatting is not enough. <laughs> okay, I'm going to make a political joke. I never talk politics on the show, and this is not meant to be political. But yeah, if you need a hard drive cleaned off, which political figure would you send it to? <laughs> Just say it. Bleach bit, break out the hammer. Um, <laughs> I've got about five drives laying around the office, some of them that probably go back to like the mid-90s and stuff, and I'm so afraid to get rid of them. Um, I actually took a drive years ago and took one of those big honking six-volt batteries uh, and took two wires from it and hooked it up to the drive, and it just started bubbling and then smoking. I'm pretty sure I destroyed it. Whoa, uh, Il Rosso uh, has a four terabyte USB HDD. What is an HDD? Hard drive. Uh, <laughs> film projects take a lot of space. I bet they do. Yeah, two. What's what does a two terabyte drive cost now? Like a little Seagate or something? They're they're cheap, aren't they? Like uh, under a hundred bucks. Sorry, I was eating a tangerine before I went on the air, and I've got those little white stringy things from tangerine floating around my mouth. Um, man, I can't keep up with you guys today. This is a good topic, Cass suggested. Ronald Schultz is late. Well, jump right in. Um, we're talking about the different ways that people back up their stuff. And I would say everybody uh, has stuff on their host computer, uh, their main computer, their DAW. Um, virtually everybody has a backup drive, whether it's a USB or external, you know, one or two terabyte. Um, some people back up to the cloud. Well, Russell says, if you don't have a backup of your backup, you don't have backup is from programmers. If you don't have a backup of your backup, you don't have backup. That was said by programmers. Okay. Yeah, I even get like bank statements and any, you know, like mutual fund statements. I get all that stuff, even though every month they say, why don't you quit getting it on paper? You're wasting paper. Uh, they just don't want to spend the money on the paper. Uh, but... I've always heard, you know, if somebody hits the United States with a with an electromagnetic and EMD attack, um, and they wipe out all the financial stuff, I want to have printouts. I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. Lori Wynn digitized all of her family home videos, tapes, years ago. Smart. Yeah, Darren Moss is asking about the comment made earlier that backing up to the cloud slows your computer. Yep, there you go. JP just got a two terabyte drive um, for $99. Yeah, I've got a solid state drive in my laptop. What a difference, man. You turn on the laptop and like 10 seconds later, it's ready to go versus the usual two or three minutes for a MacBook Pro to start up. Brad Gray says SATA, S-A-T-A, -A, is a is great for low cost backups. I have no idea what that is. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Yeah, you know, I worry about the cloud. I, we all have so much stuff in the cloud. I mean, our whole life is in the cloud at this point. But I worry about the cloud. Um, and then again, you back up to hard drives. It, it's one thing if you back up hard drives. Um, you should have it, you know, in, in your house and then certainly out of your house. I'm still not grasping the three places, but certainly better than two or one. But... Like I said, I've got drives all over the place and I label them as soon as I put stuff on there. But a lot of those drives that I've got out there aren't even computers with connectors to hook up to those drives anymore. So you'd have to buy adapters and stuff. Encrypt your data before you put it on the cloud. That makes sense. Um, Spring Lavelle says, also check out Door Jam Armor for your recording studio door, extra security. Um, and are you talking about security so that your gear doesn't walk out? Bonzo keeps his third external drive in a hole buried in the desert. Um, Bonzo, that sounds like something the Unabomber would do. What's on that drive, dude? <laughs> Oh, man. Oh, yeah, Vine. Whatever happened to Vine? MySpace. I, I never liked MySpace. Literally didn't like it from the jump. MySpace was just clunky. Oh, my gosh. You would go to that site and click on, you know, somebody's music or somebody's profile, and it would take forever to load. So there were times that, like, pictures are over here and half the pictures over there. That site was a mess. Yeah, Crash Gates has got uh, an old collection of uh, SCSI drives that won't connect to anything new. Oh, Spring's talking about the door jam thing uh, in case of a break in. MySpace was awesome for music. Yeah, when it worked. I mean, isn't it funny? What was the other one that preceded Facebook? Um, Friendster? Was that it? Can you remember the name now? Door Jam Armor. Oh, this is a great suggestion from Cass, which is blow out your computer once a year with compressed air. I do that uh, with my laptop, although there's really nowhere for the dust inside of it to go. And I used to open up Mac laptops. I was brave enough to do it. This one's a little tough to crack. Um, but yeah, I, I thoroughly believe in that. If you see the little tiny micro fans in there, they're always coated with gunk, always. Um, I do take compressed air with this computer. There are little vents behind the keyboard um, near the area where the screen hinges, and I'll stick the compressed air in there and, and blow it, but I don't know if the stuff comes out anywhere because there really aren't any other vents. ICQ, yeah. Uh, I actually knew one of the guys that was involved in that and he like they sold it to somebody AOL or somebody and he's just like he beyond rich That's right, you have to keep your faders clean on the console. That's right, if you guys haven't discovered Cramolin yet, I can't remember, I think it's spelled with a K, but I could be wrong, but Cramolin, um, many, many years ago, it was like a kind of a strange turquoise blue can. I'm talking in the mid 70s, early 80s. But I always kept Cramolin underneath the console down by my right foot when I worked on the MCI consoles, which stood for Munchy Crunchy Inside. You needed to have Cramolin uh, to do anything from pots to faders. Um, yeah, I, I was probably Cramolin's biggest user. This guy, Tom, was everybody's friend on MySpace. Wonder what he's doing today. My guess is whatever Tom wants to do is what Tom does. Uh, 
Spring doesn't ever allow people with liquid near her computer. Yeah, I was really good about that um, with uh, recording consoles, obviously. It's amazing how many people would come in, roadies especially. I had a pretty hard, fast rule about roadies. After the first day of setup on a big record, roadies weren't allowed in my control room. <coughs> I was not very popular with the roadies. Because those guys always had a beer in hand. And they loved nothing more than coming and putting a beer like on the producer's uh, desk right next to the patch bay. It, it's like there was a sign that said, put your beer here if you'd like to spill it and ruin the album. Not to mention my console. Ugh. Roadies, roadies, roadies. Do studios keep old tapes and vaults and do they have backups? I have no idea these days, but back in my day when everything was analog and on tape, um, the answer is yes. Um, whenever we had a final master of something, like even if it was just in, I had what I called a work reel, a couple of work reels for every album. And every time we had a keeper rhythm track, as soon as we got that, I would bounce that over to another 24 track. Um, and then when we got the next rhythm track that was a keeper, I'd bounce that over to a second 24 track. Um, they actually did that on Fleetwood Mac Rumors. Um, and back in the day, we would do stuff like um, put a, a stripe of time code on track 24 and two 24 track uh, two inch reels and then do a sub mix, uh, just do a rough mix down to tracks like one and two and then do the overdubs on the second reel of tape because during the overdub stage, of course, you're passing the tape over the head a zillion times. Um, and so this way you could do the overdubs on that and preserve the sound of the original rhythm track, the bass, drums, guitar, piano, let's say. Um, and then what you do is bounce the overdubs back to the master. So you've got that pristine recording of the rhythm track um, still preserved. But yeah, like for instance, the Neil Young stuff, um, when we did Comes a Time, any time that Neil or Neil and I or anybody, uh, sometimes Tim Mulligan would go to Nashville and take 24 track masters, we would ship them. Um, artists didn't like bringing them on a plane because they'd go through security. You could put it you know, in an overhead and not know that it's near some electrical. But even shipping them, and we just shipped them in, in wooden crates. But I always wondered, how do you know that like a, a truck, a Hertz truck or a semi or whatever, how do you know that those tapes aren't gonna you know, be near a generator, an alternator, well, the alternator would be under the hood, but something electrical that, you know, or left in a truck that you know, breaks down somewhere and it's sitting out in 100 degree heat in the desert. So we always made 24 track backups. Um, there you go. Um, Il Rasa, we would, we would transfer anything that was on the 24 track as soon as we had a good rhythm track take that we knew was a keeper. Um, and also, sometimes I would do a mix, a stereo mix down to tracks one and two and do my overdubbing on the other remaining tracks of the 24 track. Ooh, I'd like to see that interview with Neil Young and Daniel Lenoir. I'll bet you those uh, reel-to-reels in your attic are probably still good, Darren. You may have to bake them. Um... Spring, did you know that we've had Ken Calais not only at the Road Rally, but on Taxi TV twice? Uh, as recently as like two weeks ago, I think. What do you guys think? Um, I hate to keep knocking on Ken's door, but he and I have become pretty good friends rather quickly, and I don't feel like it, he would be insulted if I asked. Um, what do you guys think about having Ken and his daughter, Colby Calais, uh, do a thing at the Road Rally? Um, like instead of producing Fleetwood Mac, producing Colby Calais and get the father-daughter perspective on it.
Man, it's getting hazier and hazier out there. I happen to love Colby Clay. Uh, I love her records. Uh, I mentioned it one day at the office, like six months ago, and I think it was after last year's road rally. I said I enjoyed having Ken so much. Maybe I should have him back to do a thing about making Colby's records. And somebody in the staff said she's not current enough. But I don't know. Um, Uh, Bonzo, I reached out to Rick Beato. I think he's so busy testifying to Congress and having his war with YouTube that he went, oh yeah, yeah, I should call that guy. But I, I did, I, I sent him an email. Yeah, I love bubbly. Speaking of bubbly, I think I'll have another sip of this beautiful bubbly LaCroix pastique, which is actually just watermelon. Okay, so as a follow-up to that, now that we've got all that stuff worked out, um, so how do you people structure, uh, Tony Salazzo did a, a follow-up comment to Cass's question about different ways you back up your files. Um, how do you structure your folders, uh, genre, by taxi number, other tips um, when the song is done? Like, do people make a few alt mixes and stems in case um, years later they're needed, but you've rebuilt your system and it's hard to access the old files? Um, I don't believe on Composer Catalog that you can... Can you store music on Composer, Composer Catalog? Does anybody know? Because... The front end, I have played with Composer Catalog, and the front end of that would be awesome if you could use that. It, even if you had everything on a terabyte or two terabyte drive externally, but um, if Composer Catalog could uh, pull it up. Uh, uh, John Pearson, is that yes? Oh, you can add MP3s, okay. So there you go. Um, and, and do the MP3s reside, obviously they're files, but um, do they reside within Composer Catalog or does Composer Catalog act like a front end? <laughs> Colby's much more current than Fleetwood Mac. Yes, she is. John's not sure about that, but yeah, I mean, Composer Catalog is so well organized. I mean, everybody can have, everybody who uses any software sooner or later will say, well, why didn't they add that? Or why didn't they do it this way? Um, and that's, a lot of that is personal preference, but um, many of us are, are friends with Keith Lubrant, who's a, a longtime taxi member and a very successful one. And he's also a programmer and he's the guy that built it. So I. I feel like it's probably got a lot of the stuff that real end users would use because he is one. And you can add lyrics as well. Great. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't interview anybody from Scotland. <laughs> an old friend in the music industry who was like vice president of one of major labels. Um, uh, Stephen Melrose is his name. And uh, Melrose has, I, I called him the uh, Scottish pirate. He has such a thick brogue that you can't understand a word the guy says. And, and it took me like three years of being friends with him before I could even begin to understand him. Um, so to interview somebody for the, I, mean, I used to have to translate whatever his answers were at the road rally. I'd turn around the audience and say, Steve said, and the audience always thought that was funny, but it was true because I knew that I could just see the faces of the people out in the audience. They're like, what the hell did that dude just say? Um, 
You know, I haven't reached back out to Gato Blanco. I was actually a little pissed off at him. Uh, last time he, he was going to do it, and then he backed out last minute. He's definitely publicity shy. Um, have any of you guys checked him out yet? Uh, the website is the real, the real Gato, I think, G A T O. Oh, Christian is English. He just lives in Edinburgh. Okay, there you go. He's good for a drink and a fight, though. Now, now, now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Keith is one of you guys. Uh, yeah, when you watch uh, Outlander, which is largely in Scotland, um, it's... They're probably 20%, 30% of the dialogue you can't understand. Um, it's a great show, though. So nobody's talking about how you structure your folders. <laughs> I brought that up, and not one person answered, I don't believe. That's because we're busy talking about drunken Scottish people having a fight. Dan Weber says you should work with Waves on a Neve plugin. Great console to emulate. Cass's first folder is the year. Um, all right, so what do you do with that? Because what if you can't remember, and I'm getting to know you well enough where I, I think you're a very organized person, um, but I can never remember. I can get close to a year, but I'm always guessing. Like, you know, somebody says, what year did you work with Neil Young? I don't know, it was late mid to late 70s, maybe 76, 77, 78. Um, so if I had to go find something, uh, it might be tough. Um, and then again, you know, filing it by genre, well, there are a lot of things that could be in a couple of genres. Um, I don't know if I have a good answer. And I find my desktop on my laptop looks like a snowstorm usually. I don't even bother doing the snap to grid feature because um, I don't like that when you pull out one file, everything else moves. I like stuff excuse me, that when it's in a place, even though I've got like uh, organized chaos on my desktop, I know where the stuff I use every day is. And if something were to move, I'd lose it. So, um, yeah, and I find that when I put stuff in folders, I never think about it again. And then I forget to do the project. And that's why I'm a big fan of week at a glance or month at a glance whatever it is this way i can all these things are great i've got every one i've ever used in my professional life dating back to probably 1985 every single year uh, and it's amazing uh how many important things i've been able to find going back to those things but a, a good a good example of the date um, you know, sometimes, like I went through a lawsuit several years ago and I needed some contemporaneous evidence that I knew I'd written in my date book to show that uh, I hadn't been somewhere or done something on a certain date because I was out of the country or something, whatever it was. No, it wasn't a murder rap. <laughs> anyway, uh, I didn't need an alibi. I just needed to show something that I needed to prove where I was when I was there. And uh, I found it. Uh, of course, then the opposition said, well, how do we know you didn't just write it in? And I said, well, then why don't you just hire a forensic expert? They, they will show you that the ink on the first line and the, you know, the 9 a.m. thing that I wrote and the 10.30 a.m. thing that I wrote are both done the same ink in the same year. So there you go. Get yourself a forensic expert. Don't charge me for it.
you know, keywords. That's the, if you can put stuff in folders, let's say you do it by year, you do it by genre or whatever. Um, but having keywords seems like it would be a big help. I hate, I, I'm not a big fan, by the way, of the Apple search function. Um, if, if you use a little magnifying glass, that search thing works better than just doing like a, a control or a command F. Um, Michael Reschke does taxi slash 2020 slash style slash song. Oh, that's uh, somebody calling for my wife. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Little does she know she's being heard by people all over the world. That woman, her name is Sunny, and she's uh, she was a mentor. My wife got a double master's degree, like two did two master's programs inside of two years, and she was assigned a, a mentor in a particular field. And this lady, who's probably 20 years older than my wife, was her mentor. And they have been like mother and daughter ever since. It's very sweet. And she calls every Friday. Ooh, Darren Fletcher. This is a great suggestion. FETS Mixing Roadmap. He has some great data organization and consistency techniques. Uh, must have book. Yes, FETS Mixing Roadmap. If you don't have it, buy it. It's like a $30, $35 book worth every penny. I know Fett. He's actually a good friend of mine. Um, and he is OCD about organizational stuff. Um, he's also extremely smart. Um, I, I want to say he was like a nuclear physicist or something. or He worked at... 3M or IBM or the CIA, something with three letters, I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, or no, he worked at General Electric. Um, and he's very, very smart, very organized to the point of being like OCD-ish about it. So any advice he has, because the guy, all he does is work on music every day. He owns a studio in Nashville. That would be great advice. Siri has a hard time with southern accents. <laughs> oh, man. That's funny. So do any of you have the newer MacBook Pros with the little thing at the top of the keyboard? I don't even know what they call it. The, you know, like the little touchscreen navigation bar at the top of the keyboard. Um, and if you do, how do you like it? I know, we can talk about nothing for 45 minutes and it's fun. The touch bar. Yeah, do, do you guys like it? Edmund does. I've got, uh, when Ariana moved back to New Mexico, John Pearson rarely uses it. When Ari moved back to New Mexico, we got back her taxi laptop. I, I bought her... Uh, I don't know, a fairly beefy 13 inch uh, MacBook Pro. Uh, and it's got the touch bar and I meant to ask her about that. Um, that's funny, uh, John Pearson rarely uses it. Uh, Edmund Red rarely uses it. Yeah, I've never heard anybody say, wow, this is like a life-changing uh, feature. It just makes things go so much faster. Yeah, Darren Moss says he rarely uses it. Not worth buying just for that. Yeah, I wish they made a version without it that was like $200 cheaper, but... Not Apple. I mean, seriously, I, I, the computer that I'm thinking about getting, I 
can't remember if it had a one or a two gig solid state drive. I think it's a one gig. I've got a half a gig solid state in the one I'm in now, and I've still got like 100 megs left to go. Uh, I mean, uh, half a terabyte, sorry. Anyway, um, so I decided to double up this time around and get, I think I was gonna upgrade the memory from 32 to 64. Um, was buying not the, the fastest one, but, or maybe it was, it was the i9, had the i9 chip in it. And, and I know Apple's coming out with its own chips early next year, but I do know better than to buy an Apple product that's totally new. So I figure that getting a brand new one in January, which would be after the Red Rally anyway, but now it looks like I don't have to really care about having the right computer for the Red Rally. Um, I've got a magic mouse. I don't love it. As a matter of fact, it's like just sitting in a shoebox at my office. Look what I'm using. This is the mouse that actually works best for me. I don't know why, but the Magic Mouse, I'm always making mistakes with it. I do like the feature you can scroll up and down with your fingers on the mouse itself, but I got that to do that. I never trade in my computers. Uh, I think I've got about five MacBook Pros floating around the house or the office. I've got, do you remember the um, MacBook that's, uh, I think it was called the iDock or something. It was a laptop that you could slide into a dock and the dock hooked up to a desktop monitor. I believe that was my first color Mac laptop and it docked and recently, uh, the lady who comes once every other week to do house cleaning for us came up to me and said, uh, I found your computer. I found your computer. <laughs> I think she was cleaning in the closet underneath a stack of shoeboxes. And what she found was that computer from uh, 1994. I believe I had that computer during the uh, Northridge earthquake. Anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm just I, spending 3700 bucks on something. Although, uh, you know, there, I mean, if you're a homeowner, you know, like uh, to get a new pergola for the one that we have, excuse me, we just tore down that was uh, cost 600 bucks. Cost like three grand to get it built many years ago. Um, and then uh, $600 to tear it down. Uh, <laughs> Andre, Deborah from Taxi just called me on a question that I sent to the taxi staff. That's funny. Well, at least I know my wife is working hard. Uh, it's so ironic that she's at the office and I'm at the house. Anyway, hey, Glenn Letts, how are you? Um, no animal stories today. Uh, a noticeable lack of squirrels in the backyard. Um, Anyway, it's just, you know, oh, the new pergola, the replacement pergola is looking to be like five, six thousand dollars. I want to get an aluminum one and I want to get one that's got louvers that actually move because pergolas, let's face it, pergolas look nice, but they're worthless. They've got those little, you know, like one by one sticks going across the top. So it blocks out half the sun, still get roasted. If you, you can't eat lunch in Southern California in the summer under a pergola. However, having uh, like a taupe cut, taupe colored powder coated aluminum one with motorized louvers um, and some built in LEDs and maybe even a ceiling fan built in there. Now that sounds like something I can get behind. Unfortunately, uh, the one that I really, really want was like $10,000. I'm not going to do it. I just, I can't make myself spend that kind of money. And then I look at a computer, it's like $3,700, $3,800. I, I'm not cheap. I'm just, I'm thrifty. I'm careful with my money. You know, uh, I went to, I took an hour off today. Woohoo! I took an hour off. I went to the grocery store and um, 
I was very happy that my wife had given me a, a coupon for, I love um, those little Yoplait wee yogurts that come in the little glass jar that's French yogurt. They're very good. And they're normally like a buck 49 a piece, I think. Uh, they're, they're okay. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so they were on sale today, plus I had the coupon, and they actually honored both without me you know, even questioning it. So I was very happy about it. Yeah, speaking of business write-offs, uh, can't we all write off? Um, for those, I mean, many of you already work out of your houses, but I said to my wife last night, I just realized something because I'm getting ready to upgrade the, uh, the, we can't get fiber at our house, but I can double the internet speed, which I'm gonna need to do uh, again um, for the road rally stuff. And uh, I should be writing that off. I should be writing off my cable bill. Um, I mean, I don't think my wife and I have ever watched a TV show without one of us or the other one of us commenting numerous times about the music in the show. Uh, maybe I am Scottish, I'm canny with money. Well, that might be the fact that I'm Jewish might have something to do with it, but I don't think so. I really don't subscribe to that theory. I don't find it offensive, but uh, I think I'm just not stupid with money, you know? I'm a saver, not a spender. I will buy something that's expensive that I've been looking at for a long time, have done a bunch of research, and I really, really want it. And once I get past the the um, the lusting after it, uh, you got to get past the lust. And once you do that, then yeah, you know, like when I got more serious about golf years ago and. I remember I wanted a set of Big Berthas um, or Callaways, and I think the set was like $1,200. I thought a set of golf clubs was like $300, but no, like a decent, and, and 11 or 1200 bucks is not like a ridiculously expensive, Cass will know about this. Uh, that's not a lot of money, right? Like an expensive set of golf clubs would be three to $5,000 maybe. Um, yeah, you can write it off. Watch out for the capital gain. Um, that's right. I could write off that light. I, and we just got that thing back in February. There you go. I do write off the flowers. I actually pay for the flowers with a taxi credit card. And I bring them home, give them to my wife and say, look, honey, I got your flowers. She makes a face. Yeah, I could write off, uh, yeah, I work every morning, back when I was still going to the office, I, I work for an hour and a half to two hours every morning before I even left my bed, I should write off the bed. I keep my laptop under the bed. As Soon as I wake up, even if it's like 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the morning, the laptop comes out. Um, I, I probably check emails 15 times a day. When I'm working at the office, I'm talking about between the morning um, and then after dinner, you know, we, we hang out, we eat dinner, we watch TV. Um, my wife conks out before me and bam, out comes the laptop and I'm working. Uh, so yeah, I should uh, write off something. Figure average golf club price is like 200 bucks a club times 14 clubs. So there you go, 2,800 bucks. Um, couple hundred for a bag, um, another 150 for the shoes. Gotta have the right shoes, right? Yeah, it used to be that if you wrote off a room in your house as a business expense for a home office, um, it wouldn't necessarily trigger an audit, but it was a bit of a red flag. Like one of my accounts used to call it a pink flag. Um, well, there you, I got a set of Callaways, and I, I want to say I paid 1200 bucks without the bag and the shoes. Just the, oh, but you know what? Uh, I think just the irons were 1200 bucks, I think. Um, I did get a big berth, a driver. Um, I also got a, I haven't used this club in years. Actually, I think I gave it to Ralph Murphy. Um, one of the hybrids, like a, a three wood hybrid. Does that sound right? 
I didn't like it, um, and I ended up giving it to Ralph Murphy. Do you know one year when Ralph turned 65, he loved one of my clubs so much that every time we played, he would use my club. I think it was my five wood. Um, I think that was a Callaway. So I actually uh, flew to Nashville, went to a golf store, got him that club, put a bow on it, took it over to the ASCAP building, uh, walked right past security, walked into his office, sang happy birthday, put the club on his desk. He stood up totally flabbergasted. We hugged each other and he said, how long have you been in town? I said, I'm not in town. I brought you this club and I literally flew home that night. Uh, he was blown away, but uh, that's how close we were. I was just thinking about Ralph today. Man, I still miss that guy. Have you ever seen any bands where their accountant was the most creative member? Now, that's funny. Wow, you build your own clubs, buy the heads off the Tournament Pro trucks? That's cool. Cass, I would golf. With I haven't golfed in two years uh, since Ralph passed away. He was the only guy that doesn't laugh at me on a golf course. Um, and I'm not, I'm not terrible. It's like, you know, I don't shank a bunch. I'm not a power hitter. I, I can hit the ball. I would say 70 to 80% of my drives are pretty darn straight, uh, straight up the fairway. I would say that they're generally 165 to 185 yards. I'm not a long ball hitter. Um, and as I've said before, um, chipping is my thing. I, I can chip with the best of them. It takes me a little while to get warmed up on that. I suck at putting no matter what, how many videos I've watched. I took lessons on putting. I've had been coached by all my friends. I just suck at putting. I can't read a green to save my life. Um, but you know, I hit it up the middle of the fairway and if I can get within, uh, you know, like an eight iron of, of a, of a green, I do pretty, pretty good with an eight iron, uh, or a nine iron or a wedge. Pretty good. <laughs> That's right. Chipping does keep me. It's the only thing that keeps me in the game cast. <laughs> you must hit the long ball because you are tall and, and you've got that lankiness behind you. I also don't move my hips worth a damn, but I figured out years ago, I used to uh, golf with the guy, JP, you might know him. He lives in Nashville, uh, an old A&R uh, weasel friend of mine from Capitol um, and then Columbia named Marshall Altman. He moved, eventually moved to Nashville and became a producer. Um, anyway, uh, Marshall would just laugh at me, but I do this thing where I actually kind of, in shifting my weight from one foot to the other, where I actually, I, I, I'm not going to do it on camera. Um, maybe the day that I do my Neil Young imitation, I will do my driving thing, um, and show you how I do my weight shift. It's the most unorthodox thing in the world. But when I do that, I don't overthink the shot. I don't tense up. And those are always my best shots, especially like I'm not great off a, of a, a fairway with an iron. Sometimes I hit it beautifully. I, you know, take a little divot with it. It sounds good. It looks good. It goes straight. But man, if I'm on a fairway with hard ground underneath, I'm, I am one of those guys that'll be like, <laughs> you know, like a cartoon golfer. Um, Anyway, you should do a video where you visually show a mix by overlooking the golf course. <laughs> when I hit the ball up the middle, that's the vocal. I like it. Then I can write off my golf clubs. <laughs> All right, you guys, it's Friday. Go have a beer, kick back, order a pizza, enjoy your weekend make some great music. 
Um, don't forget, Monday we will be back with Stephen Memel again. Um, I'm going to try and get him to be very focused and organized. Uh, I feel like we, first of all, we didn't take any questions from you guys. So a lot of it is going to be Q&A. Um, and there were a few of the things on my bullet point list that uh, he didn't get to. So I want to do that. Try a show for my golf buggy. There you go. I love driving golf carts. Um, anyway, have a great weekend. See you on Monday. And that's it. We will be back next week on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Although I may take one of those days off um, for a meeting with the tech guys for the road rally. Have a great weekend and see you next week. Bye-bye. And by the way, I haven't forgotten these other questions. We'll get to these on Tuesday.